I would dispute your um, thesis a little bit. I mean, David Petraeus was the architect of the counterinsurgency campaign that arguably worked uh, 2007 and 2008. I mean, we were facing an Islamic State-like entity in Anbar province. And at, with Petraeus's lead, the U.S. Army at, on, on, on the pointy end of the spear, training, equipping, equipping and advising Sunni tribesmen, we pushed um, the, the Al-Qaeda folks back. So I, I mean, the tactic, the coin tactic, counterinsurgency, worked really well. What didn't work well is the interplay between counterinsurgency tactics and a political strategy. So I, I think you need to always keep in mind what is your political goal and are the means that you've selected to achieve it, in this case, counterinsurgency campaign, is that sufficient? And in Iraq, it wasn't. A lot of people argue that the principal, mis principal mistake we made was not leaving people behind. That in 2011, had we just kept forces there, but we forget the Iraqis hated us. You know, they wanted us out. So that's not a very conducive environment to conduct a counterinsurgency when you're a host government agent. Uh, my question is related to the Iraq War. Um, uh, you kind of hit on it and what I was interested in the long-sighted future of the nuclear deal. I think you hit on it when you really um, refer to it as buying time. Um, assuming the best case scenario and that everything is in place in like the 10 to 15 years as things start to come to their end, what do you see as um, judging the US policy or where we are as, in terms of um, uh, Iran getting nuclear weapons? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, and that was kind of the crux of a lot of the debate over the summer about whether this was a good deal or not. And, um, you know, the side I came on, out on is 10 to 15 years, and again, as I'm showing on that timeline, some of these uh, measures are, are much longer than that, some are indefinite, is not a bad deal in the context of the Middle East. That's a long time. Think about where we were 15 years ago in the Middle East. Oh my goodness. Um, we would never uh, so, but on the other side, there were legitimate concerns, and, and a lot of folks were against this deal because they were worried that it only buys time, and that ultimately, after the 10 or 15 year restrictions are lifted, especially on the Iranian front, that the Iranians would then legally, because they're a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, be able to then expand their enrichment program, and that is a valid concern. I think it was definitely, you know, worthy point. My focus, though, is, you know, my view is it's always against what we're trying to do. And where what we had in front of us was a program that was absolutely out of control. They were breaking the boundaries of what they could do under the NPT, because Iran is in the NPT. So it is restricted and technically and in principle, when you sign the NPT, you are saying, I'm not going to become a nuclear weapon state. Now, of course, most of us don't believe that or had concerns, and Iran did indicate with prior action that, and by the way, in the Middle East, in this kind of neighborhood, from a security and deterrence perspective, there are a lot of actors in the Middle East who wouldn't mind a nuclear option, right? So there's a lot of reasons you can understand the Iranians wanting to do that, but they committed themselves on paper, but they were able to stretch the limits to a dangerous, dangerous threshold. And we had them, at that point, with a very limited ability to know what was going on in the country. The way I look at it, we have an inspection regime that is unprecedented that will be in place even after the enrichment, uh, uranium enrichment restrictions are lifted. You're still gonna have more inspection, more verification than you would have had in the alternative. I guess Andy was kind of looking at things the same way in the ISIS fight, you always, and I think this is a good thing to do as an analyst. Always look at compared to what? Not in a vacuum, not compared to something that would be a perfect, unachievable deal. So it again gets back to my cost benefit, and I, you know, I think it's a really good point. I, if I had to predict, I think uh, both the US and Iran got to this deal because there are very good reasons on both sides that they want this deal to work. The US 
and our allies do not want a nuclear armed Iran in the Middle East. It'd be extremely destabilizing. I'm not, you know, uh, Ken Waltz was one of my professors at Berkeley way back. A very smart guy, but I am not a believer in his theory that more nukes are better. I do not think that's a recipe for stability in the Middle East. So it, we have a strong interest in that. The Iranians have a very strong interest in normalizing their and, and revitalizing their economy. They were in drastic condition. So I, if I had to predict, I think both sides have a vested interest in this working. Are there going to be crises ahead? Yes. It's a complicated, complicated agreement. Um, 10 to 15 years in the Middle East is a long time. I have no idea where we will be in 10 to 15 years. I am not going to tell you I know. I do not. Thank you both for coming to speak to us today. Um, I want this question to go to both of you, but it kind of goes to Mr. Mitman's remarks at the end. So I'd like Dr. Kay's opinion and a further elaboration of your part, Mr. Mitman, if that's okay. Uh, so in our, a recent article by the Associated Press uh, talking about Russian, uh, Russia's campaign in Syria mentioned that at least 250,000 people have been killed and half of the pre-war population has moved. So. There's 4 million roughly refugees and 8 million refugees uh, internally displaced. So obviously the longer the fight goes on, the more people that will be killed and displaced. So uh, I'd like uh, Dr. Kay's opinion on, is there a point when Syria will collapse? Um, Mr. Liebman, you indicated that you do think that will probably in all likelihood happen. And even though there are a great number of factors to consider, uh, is, if possible, could you uh, provide like a tentative uh, expectation of that? And a second part to that, if um, you don't think that Syria will end up collapsing um, and if ISIS is defeated within the coming years, what are some key points Syria would have to focus on in, in its recovery? I know, uh, Mr. Lehman, that you had indicated that we would have to go from kind of, uh, village to village within Syria, but I would like a further elaboration on that. Please, thank you. Well, um, right on your first point, 250,000 people have been killed. You know, we were talking about this earlier. It's also important to remember, most of them have been killed by the regime. Uh, some of them have been killed by the Islamic State, many of them have been killed by each, each other, but the majority of Syrian civilians who have been killed have been killed by the regime. So um, that's important to remember for when you try and chart the future possibilities. When you have a regime that's killed so many of its own citizens, it, it really makes negotiations difficult. The question on, on will Syria collapse, I think um, Actually, Syria has collapsed. And I think James, when you described the, the states that really no longer exist, I would add Libya as well, which is in complete chaos and anarchy. I'm not sure that Syria as we knew it still exists at all. It is you know, a collection of cantons that are controlled by, in some cases, militias, in some cases, um, they're larger, they're provinces. But really, there's nothing, there's no connected tissue anymore in, in Syria. And I think when a third of this nation's population, as, as is depicted here, is displaced, imagine half, half. Oh, so a third are, 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 have moved out of the country. A full half of the Syrian people are no longer in their own. It's hard, to, it's hard to describe that as a functioning state um, any longer. How do you put it back together again? I mean, I, I'm a bit at a loss. I, I'm, you know, we've talked to people who've done Bosnia, who, you know, there was massive killing and, and feuding there, but not to the extent that we have in, in Syria. And like I said, I think it's going to have to be community by community. They're going to have to stop fighting make agreements, there has to be an external force that enforces that so that you know, the Islamic State or some other entity doesn't come in. The complicating factor is in a no normal civil war, you have two sides. And, and you know, they struggle until either one wins or, or the other one does or they just both stop fighting. In Syria, you've got at least six or seven 
parties, all of whom have enough power to to um, stay in the fight, and none of them have the wherewithal to defeat it. Uh, the others. So you've got this constant. Problem. Yeah, I'll just add by touching on the refugee issue. We had anticipated a question related to this, and as in any talk on the Middle East these days, there needs to be, because uh, one of the disheartening, among many disheartening aspects of this continuing Syrian conflict, and most of us in the analytic community don't see an end to this anytime soon, and one of the most disheartening aspects of this is the fact that we know this is a not-so-slow-moving tragedy right in front of us. And um, what's really difficult is that the continuation of the conflict in Syria is destabilizing the entire region. And we don't see an end to it, and yet there's no end to the destabilizing aspects to the broader region until you end this conflict. And one of the most destabilizing aspects is this displacement crisis, which is the largest displacement crisis since World War II. This is an, uh, the mo most uh, refugees, uh, source of refugees in the world are now coming from the so um, this just gives you a sense, this is even outdated already, but the orange bubble is just, you know, within two years you can see how much this crisis has expanded. This is a, you know, when people finally woke up to the refugee crisis because of that tragic photo of that, you know, Kurdish boy on the beach, you know, this is, a, this is not a crisis that just emerged over the summer. This is a crisis at Graham we've been monitoring for a number of years, and many organizations are doing tremendous humanitarian work. But one of the things we're most concerned about, and if you look at the, the region, um, actually Lebanon right now, one in four Lebanese citizens are now a Syrian refugee. Jordanians are often remind you when you visit the country and look at the refugee camps and the situation, they, they tell Americans, it's like, put yourself in the sh our shoes. It's like if you in America absorb the entire population of Canada, that's what we are facing in Jordan today. And, and then lesser degrees, but it's concentrated in southern Turkey and then southern Iraq. I would say Lebanon's taking, you know, in pure numbers, the largest amount. There's now over 4 million totally, uh, total in the broader region, and now moving to Europe. And the reason why is because refugees in the neighboring, the neighboring countries are at capacity. They have Barely half the children are not going to school, half of, the, half of the displaced are children, not going to school, not allowed to work. This is not a sustainable situation. So this explains the desperation of these poor people on the boats risking everything to get to Europe because this is not a sustainable situation. And I would just add too that the level of destruction in Syria means mm -hmm. that for many of these people there's nothing to go home to. Their homes have been destroyed, their farms have been uprooted. Um, so it's, a, it's not just simply a matter of stopping the fighting and trying to get people to go back home. It's massive infrastructure repair. Syria, we've intentionally bombed the entire Syrian oil infrastructure because it's in Islamic State hands. It's going to have to be fixed. And the Syrians have very few resources. It's a very poor country. <coughs> Okay, we'll open it up. Uh, we've got about 15 more minutes, so if anyone else would like to ask a question, please just come up to a microphone. That'll be the best for everybody. Or if uh, <coughs> you refuse, okay, who are in here? I see you raising your hand and refusing, so we'll just call. Um, Vladimir Putin just uh, a while ago said that everyone who is fighting in Syria is a mercenary, so whoever pays them will just switch sides. Is there any truth to it? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, not that everything Vladimir Putin says <laughs> is true. Um, you know, I, I actually think the folks who are fighting with the Islamic State, generally you do find mercenaries are people who are fighting for money. And, and that's just not the motivating factor for, for most of these folks. Uh, they're fighting for a cause, which makes them a lot more dangerous. And it makes them willing, many of them willing to die for the Islamic State. Look at the number of suicide bombers. I mean, it, it, mercenaries do not become suicide bombers. Uh, I, I do agree with his, his inference that allegiances shift. So most of the people, most of the fighters who went to Syria, went to fight Assad, didn't go to fight to join the Islamic State. But many of them, the Islamic State didn't even exist. 
when they went to Syria. But they joined the Islamic State because they're the biggest and most powerful element in the country. My question has to do with um, that, the expansion of kind of the Muslim population in Europe. Um, in history, the Ottoman Empire was kind of an expansion of the Muslim uh, world. Um, this is kind of a trend um, here and history. But my question is actually about Russia. The US um, national policy helped to create the chaos in the Middle East. The Russian bombing of the CIA rebel training <coughs> camps, did that kind of bolster confidence in that area with Russia? And what the question about Russia is, do you think they'll play more of a strategic role in uh, kind of making that area more of you know, in the world. Uh, I think there's certainly an aspect to Putin's strategy that he wants to be taken seriously. He is a player on the world stage. And despite sanctions, despite his financial worries, he, he can still intervene. And among quite a few Shia, he's now seen as the, I mean, the Russians and, the, and Putin are doing what America couldn't do, which is you know, to finally take care of the terrorist problem in Syria. Oh, I think he risks radicalizing a large number of Sunnis. If he goes in there and he supports this really hateful, brutal regime of Bashar, which all of the other Sunni regimes in the Arab world despise, Putin's risking his relationships beyond Syria. And, and I, we just describe Syria as a broken country. So, it reminds me a little bit of the chihuahua that chases the bus over and over again and finally catches it. And he wonders, what the hell am I going to do with the bus? So the Syrian, the Syrian is it's a broken country. You've got the Iranians and the, and the Russians who are staking clay. What are they going to do with it? If they win, it's going to require enormous investment and continued resources to, to keep Syria afloat. I think there are real dangers for the Russians in what they're doing. I just want to add, you know, the Iranians, there is a faction, um, the Zarif, Rahani kind of group, um, that does make the argument that Iran may be reaching overstretch. Um, same kind of blowback concerns that Andy outlined for the Russians. And, you know, some analysts, Iranian analysts, are even starting to argue, let the Americans fight, fight ISIS in Iraq. You know, let's just worry about Baghdad and, 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 and you know, below. And, yeah, keep Assad. But, you know, this is a very, we've got things at home to worry about. This is very costly. So it's important to, to also watch the debates that these conflicts will stir up in Russia because Putin's got a pretty... Um, strong arm, and he's got things, you know, I, that's a whole other situation. But in Iran, it's quite contentious issue. Um, the Syria involvement by the um, Iranians has been unpopular in a lot of quarters, and I think that's going to be interesting to watch. Uh, it's a famous quote uh, by a U.S. congressman. He's not that famous, but I can't think of his name. But uh, <laughs> uh, he says that uh, politics stop at the water's edge. Tip of deal. Yeah. Tip O'Neill. I that, remember that. Oh, no, he said all politics is local. Okay. Oh, well, uh, my question is. The same thing. Yeah, well, my question is I understand that this is a very sensitive subject. And it, it's obvious that American intervention won't help. So, would you, how would you say is to, how would you gain support globally for some type of unified movement or action? to handle or to help either the Syrian, uh, the Syrian refugees and actually to help with the military or the, what's the word I'm looking for? Cool. Well, I, yeah, let me uh, again dispute your thesis a little bit. Um, right. American intervention won't work. Um, I think that, that's where you started. Yeah, like American people are tired of war. Yeah. So, you know. I, and as am I, and I, I am not an advocate of one additional American soldier fighting in, in, and putting his life on the line in, in Iraq or Syria at, for, you know, 
not for a, a really good cause. And I think if you look at the way the, Ameri the American government has, has approached this, it's in a coalition environment. So there are, at last count, something like 60 countries who are in the anti-ISIS coalition. France, the UAE, the Egyptians, the United Kingdom, Australia, they're all dropping bombs. They're, they're flying airplanes over both Syria and Iraq and dropping bombs on ISIS. So we're really not alone. And I think we've done a pretty good job of limiting our exposure to casualties. And I think it's one of the key priorities that the administration has laid out. I think it's smart. Because we've lost too many people already. But we can't just sit for the reasons I laid out. If we want credibility in the region, if we want leverage and influence in the Middle East in the future, we can't ignore the problem. This is the biggest problem the Middle East is dealing with. And I, I'm just not sure, as the world's most powerful country, we can say, yeah, you know, we're tired of this. We're, we're, we're going to go home. You guys I'll just add a little bit. Um Although I, I think we do need to be cautious about how much we think we can fix it. And, and enabling local actors who are often more effective than we can be, um, I think is important. Yeah. And uh, I would just add to that that it's important also to not always look at military options as the default. And yeah. one thing we haven't done very well in the U.S. <coughs> is we talk about it, but we haven't implemented it well, is the other tools of foreign policy in the development, soft power side especially development assistance and looking longer term. On the refugee question, average return time of refugees globally, historically, is about 17 years. So this is the lifetime of most of these kids. So this is not, yes, I would say, what a lot of times I give talks in the Middle East or refugees and really well intended people come up, what can we do now? We want to help, because Americans are good people. We, we like to help. Um, and sure, I would say, yeah, give to International Medical Corps, Red Cross, you know, do the immediate things, get the tents up, the food, that kind of thing. But at RAND, we're really focused on the long-term challenge. This is a long-term development problem. The U.S. could be doing a lot more with our coalition allies, not just fighting ISIS, but actually helping the host countries, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, um, really suffering the brunt of this refugee crisis. Europe is waking up to this now, so they can be a big part of this. Everybody's on the same side. UNHCR, the uh, UN agency responsible for refugees, is getting funded. Its calls for, for help for the refugee situation is not meeting anywhere near the demands. I think it's funded by only a third of what they asked for. So we can be stepping up our assistance. The US has been generous, but we can be doing more. We need to look at long-term education plans. We need to work with our allies like the Jordanians, figure out if there's a way to start letting the refugees work because the refugee flows to Europe are going to continue. And by the way, I don't like the term migrant when you read newspapers, because these are not individuals going by choice for better lives. They are, they are fleeing persecution, and, and, and their lives are at risk. A, the technical term would be asylum seekers, because not all of them. Some of them may you know, be in the mix. But this idea that they're migrants, that this is a choice, is just not accurate. So I think there's more we can be doing on the humanitarian and development side, but thinking about it as a longer term strategy, and we cannot do that alone. That's an international, you know, we're very good at military coalitions, international military, but we're not so good at coalitions to deal with these longer term development problems, and we need to get better. Okay, one or two more. All right, my question stems from Mr. Leeson's conclusion. However, I would Really sure I know what you mean by Iron Curtain. And, and none of the Iron Curtains I've heard of are impenetrable. So I mean, the, the, the best wall, the most effective wall I've seen built is around the West Bank uh, that the Israelis have built, and it's pretty effective. I don't know if this is a, a Trump-esque wall that, <laughs> um, or who would pay for it. We can talk. Um, 
You know, I, I don't think so. I don't think we can just let them. Time will be, uh, hopefully, uh, on our side. As I said, you know, if the Islamic State doesn't adapt, if they don't provide services to their people, if they don't govern, you know, I, I don't see how they can exist in the long term. What, what I think our military operations need to do is to accelerate that time. So don't just let them go along their merry way as they sort of sow the seeds of their own destruction. Um, and the more of the leaders, and this has worked in the past. If you, if you eliminate the really top evil leadership, it's not a, it's not a sufficient tactic to, to achieve victory, but it's a necessary component. So I think you do both. And the, and the Iron Curtain needs to be mobile. So it needs to start shrinking them, not just leaving them be. And I, by the way, I really like the way all of you guys have picked up on the fact that it's Mr. Liebman and Dr. K. As they should. <laughs> he served our country in much more important ways, trust me. Um, I used to, um, uh, because it's an interesting, I thought that's an interesting question because also there's, a, you know, kind of an allusion to the Cold War, right? And so just, just uh, building on what Andy said, which I largely agree with, I mean, what's important to remember there is that we had the Iron Curtain against the Soviets. It wasn't, and it was a containment strategy. It didn't mean we disengaged from that population on the other side. We tried to actively influence. We had a huge program to influence intelligentsia, you know, all kinds of counter-communist, um, you know, Orwell, for goodness sake, was employed, I think, by the British intelligence to write Animal Farm, right? I mean, we, we put a lot of thought into how to create a counter-narrative that might work. So I think in that sense, you know, there may be some lessons about thinking, I don't think we're a good messenger for that. The United States, we do very badly in public diplomacy. We shouldn't be the messenger. But I do think that um, the majority of folks in the region want to get rid of the Islamic State. They want normalized for their kids. They are not interested in Islamic <coughs> governance. Um, we need better messengers in the Muslim world to counter this phenomenon and ways, finding ways to support them. Um, and that ideology, and it's not just an ideo ideological issue. There's a lot of issues, development, alienation, et cetera. But without counting the ideology, I think it's going to be a very tough fight. And you need that to come from in the region. So it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of battle, but um, uh, because in the Cold War, we were looked up to, so that's not exactly the situation we face today in the Middle East, as Andy, I think, rightly said. But, that, but, the, but the idea, the concept, I think, is Okay, last question. Uh, my question is directed towards Mr. Liebman. Uh, you spoke about uh, containing ISIS and everything, and as they started to spread parts of Africa and around the world, and there are people traveling all across to go join with them, and if they go back home to their home countries and start building cells there, how do we contain ISIS then? No, that's a, that's a really important question um, that we're facing right now in, in places like Tunisia and in Belgium where they had uh, a, a fighter a couple of folks. And, um, and, and the, the problem is that these countries, Tunisians for example, uh, are probably the, the highest per capita presence of fighters in Syria come from Tunisia and the Arab world. And then, you know, this is a brand new government that just came out of the Arab Spring, the only successful example of democratization in the Middle East. They don't have the wherewithal to, to figure out how to keep how track of it. 2,500, 3,000 potential fighters. So there is a very strong effort right now, a coalition, a combined effort of sharing information among all of the countries affected to ensure that if one, if we pick up signs that a fighter is leaving Syria to go to Tunisia or Egypt or somewhere else, you know, we're in connect connectivity, then we tell them so that we can, we can help. Now, here's a challenge though. 20, 30,000 people fighting. But a lot of people come back because 
they realize when they go that this <coughs> isn't the paradise that they thought. It's, it sucks. I mean, it's hot, the food's bad, you know, it's just, it's not the romantic idea they have. So they want to come home. But when they come home, especially when they come to the United States, what happens to them? That's when we start going, okay, you were out there and we bring in questioning. Well, more than that. Well, most likely we arrest them. And under the Patriot Act, if you get arrested for materially supporting a terrorist group, minimum penalty is 15 years in jail. So that's not really a really good way of rehabilitating people who decided they want to come home. So we need to have better ways of, first of all, convincing people not to go. To help countries who don't have the security capabilities that we do to, to do the same. And then to make sure we know when they're coming back. And then when they come back, we don't automatically just throw the book at them and put them in jail. It's, it's going to be, I, I, I think I said this, if the Islamic State may go away, um, maybe five years, seven years later, it will shrink. We're going to be dealing with the effluent of the Islamic State for generations. When you're my age, and you have my haircut, <laughs> and you're going to be sitting here, you'll have the same conversation. This is not a short-term problem. It's 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 going to be with us for a very long time. All right. Well, if you would join me in thanking our guests, this is a wonderful. Thank you. fascinating and to all of you thank you for coming I have to say it makes me extremely proud when someone comes from Santa Monica and says that we have one of the best dressed audiences um, regardless of that's not hard not to diminish how good everyone was but um, can you put how many flip-flops in our office yeah. <laughs> yeah. great yeah. best of competition okay well um, for those of you who have the reservation we are going to go over to Cortez Hall, we'll have reception, drinks, etc. Then we'll have more food, and then we'll have more questions. So that'll be great. And for those of you who are coming to that, thank you all for coming to this. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. See you next time.